Hello everyone and welcome back to a new video and in our introduction to the finite element method series in which we're going to be talking about the book a first course in the finite element method by Dariel and Logan. And in today's video, we're going to be starting chapter five, which is going to be talking about frame equations. Now, I'm very happy to start this because it's really like a culmination of everything you have seen so far. Without further ado, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Okay, now the construction of the stiffness matrix of a frame element is rather straightforward. Now we need to understand what a frame element is. A frame element is an element that carries everything. It carries, it carries axial forces, it carries shear forces, and it carries bending moments. With that being said, well, it's going to be a mix between a beam equation and a truss equation. It's going to be a mix because it's going to be able to carry everything. Basically, if you add the beam equation to the truss equation, you get the frame equation. Look at this. You have the negative 1, or you have the 1, minus 1, minus 1, 1 from the axial truss element. And you can see, of course, this only affects the u1, which is the movement local in x, the u2, which is the movement local in x in the second node, this is totally fine because you know that those affect u-1 and u-2. However, those don't affect u-1 and u-2. Those affect the vertical movement of 1, the rotation of 1, the vertical movement of 2, and the rotation of 2. And the good news are that those two are not coupled, like there is no addition between them. It seems that you are just expanding a matrix and putting here in the red circles the truss elements and in the red boxes the beam element which is perfectly fine and it's really good and that's the reason why i'm not going to basically go into the derivation of this element because it has the like, even if you want to derive using energy methods you would basically derive the truss equation and derive the beam equation and then just add them together now i'm saying that there is no coupling between the axial direction and the shear and moment I can see you, dear MSc and PhD levels, talking about all kinds of nonlinearities and all kinds of coupling. This is a really deep topic. I don't want to go into it. But what I want to like reassure you is that most commercial softwares just deal with the decoupled axial and bending moment and shear force uh, stiffness matrix. There is no coupling here. If you want to go to the realm of science, you might think of coupling elements. And becomes really spicy there. That's basically where your PhD and MSc thesis start. Of course, the local displacement multiplied by the local stiffness gives you local forces. And you can see the finite element friendly directions here, noting that there is a difference between the finite element method directions and the shear force bending moment directions. And of course, this has been discussed in beam videos, and I will be linking stuff above. Of course, just to remind you, with this lecture, in case you're stumbling to our channel for the first time, this lecture is part of a video series in Finite Element Method, which, is which, which I'm going to be linking on the top right. So it seems we have our local stiffness matrix. What remains is our transformation matrix, because now frame elements have, could be in any direction in space. And of course, if something is inclined, if you have global axes and you have a theta, then you will have a transformation matrix. Now, if you remember, the transformation matrix for a truss was, I think, C S negative S C with zeros everywhere here, and C S negative S C with zeros everywhere here. You can see this happening here, which is basically your truss transformation matrix, okay? And there is some expansion here with a 1 for the theta. The reason why a theta has a 1 is because the rotation doesn't need to be modified. If your element is like this, the rotation is like this, counterclockwise. If your element goes up, the rotation is counterclockwise. If your element goes in this direction, the rotation is counterclockwise. Because the rotation, counterclockwise, according to the right-hand rule, is going to be in a vector perpendicular to your paper. So no matter how your frame element is located in 2D space, I'm speaking about 2D space. No matter how the element is um, oriented in your 2D space, your rotation is always going to be counterclockwise and there is no uh, modification or transformation necessary. This is totally different when we talk about it in 3D space, but that's a topic for next time. 
Okay, so we have our transformation matrix, and now I need to remind you of all the stuff we talked about before in this series, in which we're going to be saying the global elemental stiffness matrix is going to be T transpose KT. I mean, how did we derive that? We derived that by saying F local equals K local multiplied by displacement local. Now, I can modify displacement local into global by saying TD, because transformation multiplied by global gives you local. Because the transformation matrix takes the global and maps it to the local, you see, global multiplied by transformation matrix gives you local. Also, the F can be transformed into the global by T F. And the final step, of course, is to take the T and throw it on the other side by means of inversion or saying F equals T transpose K local. TD, and you can see me saying that the inverse of your transformation matrix is T transpose. That's a very specific property of the transformation matrix that we might have discussed before, so take a look on that. This is a quick rundown of what we're doing. So I think we're ready, basically, because now I can just run the slides and show you some cool stuff. Now, the book just throws in a bomb here and basically tells you that, well, you see, the global stiffness matrix for a frame element in 2D is this abomination. And this abomination is basically T transpose multiplied by K local multiplied by T together. It was evaluated by mathematics. Now, this is an abomination, and I never used that, to be honest. Like, I have never used this. I never used this because I like to use the local stiffness matrix and because there is need for the local stiffness matrix. You need the local stiffness matrix to find the local forces, which will help you to draw the shear force diagram and the bending mode diagram. But of course, this is a topic for another video. Today, we're not going to be drawing shear force and bending mode diagrams. Uh, okay, so there is an example, because that's everything I wanted to talk about in the theory department. So here is an example for you. This is a frame made out of three elements, as you can see. And the three elements have lengths of 10 feet, and there are some forces and moments applied. There is a force in the X, 10,000 pound at 2, and there is a positive moment, counterclockwise, 5,000 at 3. Notice that the inertia is 200 for element 1 and 3, and 100 for element 2. So let's get into it. Now, well, how do I do that? Well, this is where MATLAB comes into play, and I want to show you what I have done. How do I do this? Well, first of all, element number one, which is basically the left side element, which goes from node number one to node number two. And to be able to deal with it, I need to understand that, well, theta equals 90 degrees, which allows me to evaluate the transformation matrix CS, negative SC, and so on, as you can see in the matrix. And now I have a local stiffness matrix. I'm going to use T transpose KT to find, of course, there's a dash missing. Dear teaching assistant, I'm going to use T transpose local T to find the global stiffness matrix. And for that, I have a MATLAB script that I use in MATLAB. Of course, you can use any mathematics software you want or just plain old hand calculations. Of course, if you are taking this math, if you are taking this finite element method course, then you must know of MATLAB or Octave, the open source counterpart of it. So what we have here is commands from MATLAB. CLC stands for clear screen. Clear stands for clearing all elements uh, or unknowns. I define my inertia, define my elastic modulus, my area and my length in, pa in inches, and my theta in radians. I try to find cosine theta, sine theta, assemble my local surface matrix, find the transformation matrix, and then just find the global surface matrix, which is T transpose KT. If I run the script, of course, in the next element two, I would have to change the inertia and change the theta. And in three, I would have to revert back to my 200 inertia and with a theta of negative 90. That's what we'll be changing. Now, following the mathematics here, or uh, MATLAB, you have a global stiffness matrix of the following values for element number one, global stiffness matrix of the following ma values of element number two, and the global stiffness matrix of the following values for element number three. Now, you see me brushing through the stiffness matrix as if they are nothing, the reason why I'm brushing through this is because I've explained this, like this has been a task we know so far, and I don't want to keep repeating things you have seen before because I respect your time. Of course, you can check out my previous videos if you want detailed explanation as to how we assemble that stuff. So, uh, with that being said, how am I going to assemble the global service matrix? 
Well, I did everything kind of one step because, I mean, we should be pros by now. This is element number one. You can, me see, you can see me dashing the first, second, and third rows, the first, second, and third columns. The reason why I'm dashing those is because I am basically adding all the three stiffness matrices together and dashing in one step. I'm dashing those because element uh, node number one is fixed and node number four is fixed. If node number one is fixed and node number four is fixed, this means that there is no movement in X, there is no movement in Y, and there is no rotation. And that's why they get eliminated. Of course, for node number two in element, of course, remember, this is like node number two. There is in element number two, node two with two, so those must be added together. Node number three with its node number three you have here in the blue box. So you add those together and eliminate what you see, and of course, you get the final global stiffness matrix after condensation. Condensation means the deletion of the elements that have been supported. And after, the, after you do this, basically you get to this stiffness matrix, which has a 10,000 here, which is the force in X on the frame, because remember, there is a 10,000 here. And then you have a 5,000 here, which is the moment on the element on the node number three, and it's positive because counterclockwise, because counterclockwise is positive. With, with that being said, you can find the displacements, which you can find by inverting K, like you can say, for example, here, uh, because remember, F equals KD, so you have to left multiply, and from that you can find your displacements. That's not enough because you might, uh, you might be interested in the local forces, and local forces we will find. But before I show the mathematics, allow me to make a quick rundown of the logic here. We have the global displacements. Let's say I want element one. Element one has a fixed support and a node at two and at one. And I want to find the internal local forces of element number one. To do this, I'm gonna be using F local equals K local multiplied by displacement local. Now, K local I can find, uh, which is basically the expanded form, this one. This one is my local K. I can basically easily find it. Now, what remains is the F local, and that's what I am willing to calculate, and the D local, which I need to find from the global D. Now, the displacements of element number one are between node number one and node number two. This means that you would have a vector here of displacements, zero, zero, zero for node number one, because it's fixed support, and 0 0.211, 0, 0 0.00, basically those things in node number two. This is the global displacement of the element. However, you have here local. So how can you find local? The local displacement of an element equals a transformation matrix multiplied by the global displacement. And that's basically what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna show you now this in mathematics. So you can see this is the local stiffness. That's the transformation matrix for element number one. Those are the global displacements for element number one. And of course, if I multiply the global displacements by the transformation matrix, I get the local displacements. Multiply them by the stiffness matrix and you get the local forces, which are gonna be used to draw the shear force diagram and bending wood diagram. Of course, drawing the shear force diagram and bending wood diagram is not going to be the topic of this video because today is our first video. So I don't want to dive in all of those things in one video. But to basically summarize, that's the answer for you. Because you can, this is for the element number one. You can rinse and repeat for element number two. How do you rinse and repeat for element number two? Well, you go to your stiffness, you go to your displacements here. Element number two connects two and three, so it will take all those displacements. You multiply by the transformation matrix to get the local displacements, and you multiply by the local stiffness matrix to get those things. Similarly, element number three. This basically ends my example for you today. I know it might be a short example, but I have to start simple. The next example will have, of course, our, hopefully, a distributed load, and it's gonna be more spicy because we're gonna be drawing the bending moment diagram for the next example, and shear force. But for now, I think that's enough for an introductory video in chapter five. So of course, I hope that you enjoyed the video, and before I finish, I want to give a 2D frame-sized shout-out to our dear channel members whose names are going to be shown on the screen 
I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as the support of our membership helps me immensely. With that being said, I hope that you enjoyed the video and that it was beneficial for you. Of course, if you have enjoyed the video, then please like, share, comment and subscribe, especially subscribing and thanks to the 2K because, uh, as it increases the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video.